talk to you about today is kata. Korean styles call it hyun or pumse. We're going to take one kata and explain to you the movements within the kata, both grappling and striking techniques. Forms are used to practice self-defense techniques. That's the way the information was passed on 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, all the way back. They didn't have video cams to record. They didn't have the books like we have them nowadays. You didn't have the ability to go out and study martial arts with other people. Martial arts was passed down from father to son or daughter from one village. They kept it. And the best way to do that, to remember the fighting techniques, was to practice the forms. Forms will give you efficient means of self-defense techniques. When you use a form, it has to look exactly like the kata to use a self-defense technique. If you see self-defense moves that don't look exactly like the form, then you're not getting a good application, in my opinion. To make the techniques work correctly, you have to make use of pressure points, vital points, places on the body where pain can be directly input and cause the person to pass out or even kill the person. You can make people sick with pressure points. So when you practice these pressure points, you have to use an extreme amount of caution. I'm going to be showing you a lot of pressure points in the course of this tape. And I will show you how to do knockouts in this tape. And they will work. But you need to know how to revive the people that you're doing them on. You need to know safety to actually knock somebody out. You have to understand the safety precautions. I want to talk about safety first. And as we talk about safety, we'll start understanding a little bit more about the forms. The first thing, if somebody is over 40 years of age, do not knock them out. Do not strike people on pressure points who are over 40 years of age. At 40, your body starts wearing out. And these pressure points affect the internal organs of individuals. So if your heart is beginning to wear out and you strike people that are over 40 on pressure points that affect the heart, you have the potential of causing them some serious bodily damage. The same thing goes with the lungs, liver, kidney, spleen. All of the internal organs can be affected by vital point techniques. If somebody has a bad heart, don't do pressure points on it. It's not necessary. If somebody has a bad spleen, liver, kidney, if they're on any kind of medication, don't hit pressure points on it. If somebody has low blood pressure or high blood pressure, don't hit pressure points on it. It's dangerous. You're going to hurt them. If somebody's using cocaine or marijuana or any other illegal drugs, don't hit pressure points on them. I've seen on any number of occasions people get hit on pressure points that are using drugs. I, by accident, have hit people using drugs. And you get an immediate very, very strong effect on pressure points. It's so strong that the people get sick and they're very difficult to revive. If you use illegal drugs, do not allow anyone to hit you on pressure points. Pressure point techniques also require that you have a good knowledge of anatomy and physiology. You should have a good working knowledge of acupuncture because that'll give you some clue as to what's going on with the body when it's getting hit. An important rule to remember is we make use of points that are used in acupuncture, but we also use points that are not used in acupuncture. And we do not use all of the pressure points that an acupuncturist would use. We're going to use places on the body that you can get to immediately in a real fight. Vital points that you can reach in a real fight. 
there's a pressure point on the bottom of your foot. That's pretty hard to get to in a real fight. So be careful. Do not hit pressure points on somebody unless you know what you're hitting and what the effect is and how to revive them if they do pass out from a pressure point technique. If you don't know or understand revival technique, please do not hit people because you can hurt your training partners seriously. When you're training, when you're working with pressure points, you can only do pressure points on one portion of the body at a time. Work only the arm. Do not try to go in the arm and then the body, or the body and then the legs. You'll make somebody sick. Pressure points will stay active, fully active for 20 minutes. So if you want to change parts of the body that you're attacking, wait at least 20 minutes. My preference is to wait a full 30, just to give a little bit extra margin of safety. But if I wait 20 minutes and hit pressure points, they still may be active. So I like to let myself have 30 minutes between pressure points or areas of pressure points that I hit. When you're doing pressure point techniques, never hit pressure points more than 15 minutes per week because you can cause some injury. When you go out to a seminar sometime and you see... Uh, people teaching pressure points, there's going to be a time where pressure points are worked hard for more than 15 minutes in a day. That will be an unusual occurrence, and that shouldn't bother you. And people who go out and teach the seminars and pressure points should know enough about pressure point techniques to give you time to relax so you're not going to get sick and work pressure points not real hard and heavy for a full four, five, six hours, whatever the length of the seminar is. Instructors should know how to do that. But for your own use as students, do not allow yourself to be hit hard on pressure points for more than 15 minutes per week. It can be very, very dangerous. Okay? When you're working pressure point techniques, the thing that makes what we do unusual or different is that we're using multiple pressure point attacks to affect knockouts, and we're combining the pressure points with the forms, whether it's a Korean-style form, a Japanese form, an Okinawan form, a Chinese form, or any other form of martial art. We make use of the pressure points in the forms that the person does to give you good, solid self-defense techniques. Now, what I mean by using multiple points or attacking multiple points is real simple. If you attack one pressure point, you're going to find pain at that pressure point. If you attack two pressure points, you'll find pain between the two points. If you attack three pressure points, the correct angle, direction, and amount of force, you'll affect a knockout with a 100% chance of revival if the person is not using drugs, if they're not over 40 years of age, if they do not have any medical or physical problems that could be exacerbated by striking pressure points. If you strike four pressure points with a correct angle, direction, power, you will knock the person out and you'll have a 90% chance of reviving them, which means that there's a 10% chance that you will not revive them. They're dead. So we don't like to go out and hit four pressure points with a correct angle and direction and knock somebody out. We'll do three pressure points to get a knockout, but not four. Five pressure points, correct five pressure points with direction, angle, and power will kill the person, and you cannot revive them. They're dead. That's all there is to it. They're dead. Obviously, we don't practice those techniques. And where you can get five pressure points and cause an immediate death of an individual... We really don't show, unless we know the individuals well and trust them, that they're not going to go out and try and hurt somebody just to be a bad guy. So there is some information that's withheld. 
And I think everybody can understand why we do that. We want to make sure certain techniques stay uh, back from the general public so they don't hurt people. Because we go out and we do a seminar, and there's 15, 20, 30, 40 people, 75 or 100 people, whatever. And if we walk up and we show these people that we don't know how to kill, what kind of responsibility do I feel morally? So we have to withhold a certain amount of knowledge until we get to know who you are and trust you that you're not going to misuse the knowledge. Pressure points, when we teach them, it's sort of like giving you a loaded gun. The question comes up when I go out and do seminars at times, well, show me how to revive. I'm a little reluctant to do that. Because if you hit somebody and they've got a bad heart and you're knocking them out, and they don't come back, you may come back and say, but Mr. Clark, you said this would revive the person, and it didn't. They died. Or you may hit a pressure point that you find in a book and hit another pressure point and say, but I only hit two pressure points, and they died. Well, there's a reason for that. Some acupuncture points that you'll see in charts, some pressure points in the back of the karate magazines and books that you'll see are actually three points located in one small spot that you can hit and immediately knock the person out with a one-strike technique. So if you think I'm hitting only one point, I could in actuality be hitting three points. And if you have one other point there, that's four points, which could give you the knockout and maybe not revive the individual. So I'm a little reluctant to teach people how to revive until I know them real well, and they understand the dangers that go along with that. If I'm a, a combat firearms instructor, my job is to go out and teach somebody how to put a grouping of bullets within a target. My job is not to teach you how, once you shoot the individual, to go take the bullets out, suture them, give them an IV, give them some penicillin, and get them back into good health. My job is to teach you how to shoot that individual and drop them. Then you call an ambulance and take them to the hospital, and they're healed, hopefully. So what I want to do is I want to show you techniques, understand that you have to use a great deal of discretion when you practice these kind of techniques. And if you don't have an instructor or you're not an instructor that's fully trained in pressure points, be very, very careful because you can hurt somebody permanently with this. What I want to show you today is a kata in Korean style called cholgi. Japanese style call it teke. And Okinawan style calls it naihanshi. The form done Korean, Japanese, or Okinawan is very, very similar. There's some very small changes that are developed because each style will do the form just a little bit different. But the basic movements are the same. The applications of the basic movements are the same. And if you don't do this kata, this form, perhaps you'll see movements in the form that you do someplace in forms that you currently do. And then you can apply the techniques that I'm showing to those movements. So what I'll do is I'll walk through the form very slowly, give you some idea what the form looks like, and then go through it a little bit more at speed uh, to give you an idea of how I practice the form, and then start breaking the movement down, breaking the forms down to individual movements for grappling and for striking techniques. So, again.
this form was taught originally to very beginning students in the martial arts. In Okinawan karate, this is the first form that's taught. At Indiana State University, where I teach, this is the first form that I teach my students there. I can do the form backwards, watch my students, and they can see the movements being done as if I were standing in front of a mirror. There's no turns, there's no twisting movements, like the basic age forms in most forms. Very simple, direct form. So it's a good one to begin with, a good one to learn with. A little complicated, but it's easily mastered by students when they first start out. A little bit more at speed. This form can be broken down into grappling and striking techniques. Each form has different layers or levels of understanding. <clears throat> you have the first level that's taught in most karate schools, martial arts schools, block and punch. <coughs> Somebody attacks me, I block the attack, and then I punch them or kick them. Second level, where we're going to start getting into, is a joint lock or a controlling technique, where you break the person's arm or leg, neck, something, you break a joint. The next level up is each movement can be a knockout. I can knock somebody out with this technique. And the fourth layer, the most dangerous, is that you kill a person with a movement. 400 years ago in the Orient, when somebody practiced this form, they had one purpose and one purpose only in mind, and that was to kill the person that was attacking them. Nothing else entered their mind. They didn't stand out there and try and block and punch somebody, because if you stand there and block and punch and trade punches back and forth, Somebody's going to get hurt, not necessarily me, but not necessarily the other person. In a real fight, you want to end it as quickly as you can with as little amount of chance of you getting hurt. And when they're down, you want them to be dead. That's how they thought 400 years ago. Today, it's the same way if your life is on the line. That's why I said this is a bit like giving you a gun because some of the things are very dangerous. What I'd like to start out with is to show you some beginning motions, some of the techniques, what these are and how they're used, some of the applications. Many people, when you talk about karate, this is a salutation. I'm getting ready to start the form. Now the first technique comes out, and I've done a technique. This, right in here, this movement can be a technique that's used in real self-defense. I'll show you a grappling movement first, and then go on to some striking applications, and just start working out with that. Okay. Uh, Chad, I'm going to borrow you here a second. A lot of fights start with somebody pushing. When they push, I grab their hand. You want to try and bend their little finger back just to touch. And if their arm is out straight, there's a pressure point here that we'll go into in just a second, that you would hit and bend the arm. So that you bring that arm in and bend it at 45 degree angle. The hand comes onto the chest, and I would step across like the form and begin a wrist lock here, take that out. If I stepped all the way out into the horse stance, like we did, the person goes down. But the kata comes here and down, and then they step. And 
and you have the backhand. If I take that step across and I make use of the backhand, here, I can strike across the back of the neck as I pull this hand back here, or just hold it onto the body. There's a pressure point right back here on the back of the neck, right there. This is a dangerous pressure point. If you hit it hard enough, you might cause a person to go blind. You will knock them out with the right angle and direction. The angle and direction would be to strike it in and slightly up. But the form has the hand coming directly out to your side here. So if I'm coming across and down here, and I come across here, I can get a nice buzz off the individual and get them to begin to go out. From behind, this direction, the push, the grab, and the strike makes the person lose their balance a little bit. Next year. The other way to do this technique, to make it more into a striking technique from just here, is Mike. If a person's coming in close to you, you make use of this first motion here. If they're in at a fairly close distance and they're giving you a little trouble, you just hit them on those two pressure points right behind the neck, okay, and take them down. I can take the same motion here, hit pressure points on the back of the neck, and knock him out. Just by... how his legs locked out? It's the energy shot right down his legs and out. Old headache. Your heart skin reflex like a sweat. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Now this makes it a little more difficult or a little more dangerous in that I hit both sides of the pressure points at the same time. That's not a good idea to do hard. I tapped with my fingertips. I did not hit the person hard. I just slapped Mike very lightly. Because if I hit, a shame. If I hit the pressure points hard, I would cause the person to pass out very deeply, and I don't want to do that because that is dangerous. And there's a pressure point right at the wrist. I'll give you an example. If you're about the same size hand-wise, and you lay your finger right up like this when you're shaking hands and you feel a pulse on the wrist that is the pressure point that your finger's on right along the edge of the bone the end of your finger is on a pressure point if I press in this pressure point in here he bends that direction in the direction of the pain if I press on the opposite side he bends the opposite direction if I press both points at the same time he goes right down the middle the pain meets in the middle he decides that's where he wants to go, right down the middle, okay? This pressure point is designed to hit at a 45 degree angle back and toward you. It'll open the wrist, or excuse me, open the fist. If I strike this at a 45 and pull it in toward me like that, the hand pops open. This technique, this pressure point can be used in many grappling situations, and it can be used for throwing techniques as in Aikido or Jiu-Jitsu. If the person comes in and grab, you can begin to turn the person under and around and throw them. This point activates the fist, opening and closing it. Okay? When you're grappling or grabbing, you can be grabbing with your thumb on that point. Okay? So if I'm in here, my hand here for this wrist lock, if I come here to take it down, I can also do the same thing by torquing on the wrist and activate that pressure point and help this wrist 
the fist be weak. So if they're in here, I put my knuckle right there. On that pressure point, grab and twist and torque. See how he's beginning to turn with that? And then I turn my body the opposite direction and you take them down really easy. The next motion after this in the form is a strike with the elbow. We combine our back up a pressure point, or excuse me, back up a technique. We'll back up a technique. If a person grabs with both hands, let's turn over this way, with both hands, if I pull my hand back to my hip and strike out to the side at the same time, his hands will come loose. It's very difficult for him to resist two movements at the same time. So if I bring my hand to the side like this, I now have this pressure point, which is just opposite of the one I just showed you, just opposite, I'm grabbing on that pressure point, right on the side here. So, across and out, grab this pressure point, bring it back to your waist, and the kata movement looks like this, doesn't it? It's right out here. So if the hand comes like this, I'm out, and what's the next motion in the kata? I come back like this for an elbow strike. Hmm. A lot of people say that an elbow strike like this means that you grab the person's head, and you're elbowing. Shane's taller than me. It would be very difficult for me to reach up to Shane, grab his head, and throw an elbow up here and do any good. Because he's going to be punching and kicking at me. If, however, we're in a grappling situation, and I let my hand come across like this, now I can bring it down here and strike with the palm of my hand on that point that i just shown you back in the back of the neck, daze them, strike back down, look where his head is now. Now it's possible to use your forearm to catch him on the side of the jaw, the side of the neck, or even turn his head directly into you so you're taking your forearm right into the front of his face. Now that's a striking application, a grappling application for this movement, and a striking application for the elbow. <clears throat> Could it be something else? Sure. Say I got my hands up and he grabs my hands. Now watch. What have I got here? Same position my hands in. Hands are up. And you got a wrist lock. Break the wrist, right? Hmm. Gee, is that the only explanation? No. What if he grabs? I can do that same elbow again. Only now I'm not doing an elbow, I'm actually doing a fist. I hit that on the hand here and take him out. You can have a seat, thank you. <laughs> elbow, down to here. Okay? We go down to here. He grabs, I take that wrist lock out, I bring it all the way down. What's the next move in the kata? A down block. I'm down blocking his head. There. You sit down. <laughs> so I down block the head. We'll go into this pressure point real, real quickly and let you know that when you bend the elbow, if I put the tip of his elbow in the center of my palm and roll my knuckles, my knuckles will be about an inch above his elbow, and at that point, there is a Golgi, are there Golgi's tendon pressure receptors. There are about one Golgi's tendon body to every fiber in that arm between the tendon and the muscle you will get an involuntary reflex for the muscles to relax. That's called a Golgi's tendon reflex. It's a pressure receptor. It only responds to pressure. It does not respond to a strike. If I hit that, even if his arm is out and stiff, I'm not bending his arm. But if I press and rub, I take him down very easily. Same way with the arm to the side. I'm going to have my arm on here, 
push and roll the arm down to the side and get that reflex action. Thank you. If you turn the person's arm, so the little finger is about a 45 degree angle from you, right where that muscle rolls around, right in there is a pressure point. Okay? That pressure point affects the heart. If I'm holding this pressure point down at my wrist, at his wrist, tight, and I'm going to lightly tap that, because he's not one of my students, I'm going to lightly tap him, you will cause a little shock to go down the arm. Okay? And the angle is going to be here and down. If you turn the finger at a 45 degree angle out, halfway between the shoulder and the elbow, right on the edge of the muscle, right in a little valley right down here, is a pressure point. If you grab the wrist tightly, turn a little bit so I don't hard, and strike this down just like it looks like a down block. Instead of going for the Golgi's tendon, there's a point right up on the side of the flag here that if I hit, you can knock the person out with. Each of the techniques in here, in the kata, are very effective when you take somebody out. It is somewhat dangerous. You do have to revive the individual. You have to know how to do the revival. So this that shows as a down block in many places can be a way to knock somebody out if you do it correctly. If you do it rather lightly, uh, If you just do it rather lightly, you can get the person just to buckle a little bit and bend over. If you do it correctly, hard, the right angle and the right direction, they go out with that. So we've got this down here. Now we come across for a punch. If a person grabs you, let me get a big guy. Wait, let me use you. If we get a big person and they grab me with a cross-hand grab, if I pull that back to my waist and punch across, but now I have the Golgi's tendon back here, where I pull it down to my waist and up hard and step into a deep, long horse stance, you break the person's arm very easily because you get the point to relax. You snap up and underneath of it. That's a grappling application. A striking application is if you hit a pressure point right up underneath the arm. Again, the tip of their elbow lays into the center of your palm. If you lay your thumb right in between the muscles, that is a pressure point just by pushing. Now, if I were doing this for real, you would take the person's arm, turn it, and punch into that point. I will not punch anybody there. I do not want to punch anybody there because it is an extremely dangerous pressure point. Believe me, if you hit this hard enough, you can paralyze their arm. You may give them a heart attack. This directly affects the heart. Never, ever do that on their left side. If you're going to practice it and try it, do it on their right arm only. To give you an example, I'm going to use that knuckle and I'm going to strike 
very, very lightly here. I will not hit it hard. Watch how little my hand moves. I do not want to punch that on someone because it is very easy to bruise that area. It is very, very easy to hurt somebody with that technique. Do not try punching anyone there unless your life is in danger. That is very, very dangerous. So this movement here can be a punch to the arm and drop the individual very, very quickly. The next motion here, twisting, a back fist, again, can be a very quick and efficient technique. It can be used as a grappling technique, or it can be used as a strike. If we combine the down block with an arm bar and this technique, we can make a person go into down into an, uh, an arm bar very, very easily. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Shane, let me use you again. I'd like to use Shane because he's big. Paul, if someone grabs here, I want to pull my hand back to my waist and do a back fist. This is for a grapple. Grab on a sleeve, back fist. Notice how that bends his arm. If I've grabbed right on his sleeve, right above the Golgi's tendon, I can now do the down block by grabbing his wrist, and I'm down a down block, where I take him right down. But you can also use this back fist as a striking technique. If I come in along the side of the neck, right along the sternocleoid muscle, right here, right where you feel a pulse, is a bifurcation of the carotid and the jugular. And a lot of people, when you're talking about knockouts and you see pictures or you hear people talking about you're hitting somebody on the side of the neck and knocking them out, they say that you're hitting the jugular or you're hitting the carotid and that you're stopping the flow of blood to the brain. And that's why the person passes out. That's a partial truth. What actually happens there at the bifurcation of the carotid and the jugular, and bifurcation means that it's like a Y, right in the middle of that. There are pressure receptors. There are actually stretch receptors called baroreceptors. If I stretch a baroreceptor slow, gently, and easily, the blood pressure in the body will drop slowly, gently, and easily. If I stretch the baroreceptors quickly, the blood pressure changes quickly. The blood pressure drops quickly. The body wants to equalize the blood pressure in the body. So it lays out flat, so the blood pressure can equalize. So if I get and hit a pressure point quick here, off and on, very quickly, you get a little buzzy sensation like that. Now if you get, man, why don't you come up behind him? Now I'm not going to come in, turn and grab and twist him down into here to hit this, because that makes it more dangerous. I'm going to just put my arm here and just use a flat, muscly part, both bones out, and just lightly tag him on the neck, not and get a nice buzzy sensation out of that. If you crank on that hard, you stand a chance of maybe dislocating or jostling around the third or fourth cervical vertebrae, which is very, very dangerous. On the third, thanks. At the third cervical vertebrae, Nerves go out to control the diaphragm and the lungs. If I disrupt that, then the lungs don't work too well. The diaphragm doesn't work too well. And if you would break at that point, snap the neck, and disrupt the nerves, the person dies. So I do that really lightly, not very hard. My main intent is to just to get on and off the baroreceptor and get his blood pressure to begin to move a little bit. You have that in the form. Then you have a technique like this. This technique here can be done high, it can be done low. Either way it works. Okay. The same technique coming down here in this punching area could be used to strike down on the arm and punch pressure points on the face. Pick a point on the face, use the knuckles, 
and punch up and strike straight into them. doesn't matter if they grab with one hand or both hands. When you're like this and they've grabbed you, you still have both hands free. Bring the hand down and under and punch and hit a pressure point on the body and take them straight out. It is so effective to hit pressure points on the head. If I'm down here, you can buzz someone very nicely, very easily, and take somebody out with that. For example, on a person's head, there are three pressure points. One is right here and two right here. You have three points that are grouped together. If I make my hand in a cupping shape, like a popping sound, when you clap, I can use this portion of my hand, this portion of my hand, and the base of my palm to strike on his forehead right in here. I'm going to put my hand behind his head so when I hit it, it doesn't whiplash his head back. I'm not going to try and hit pressure points on the back of the head. That'd be cheating. You don't need to cheat. I just don't want him to be you know, jarring smack with his head. But right on here, and a little twisting action will get the person to buzz. slappy palm action can also be included with a technique here in Naihanshi. This technique can take a person out and very and hurt them very, very badly. In demonstrations, I'll open my hands and hit with the palm of my hand and the back of my hand. If you use the fist, you have a potential of killing the individual. Uh, man, that's my catching. If I use the knife edge of my hand, reverse knife edge here, and hit here, and palm on the head at the same time, you can take the person out. See? If you do that technique with a fist, you stand a potential of hurting the person seriously. You can hurt them with this, don't get me wrong. You can really hurt somebody badly if you hit them too hard with it. You get a headache out of this technique. I know, I've been hit with it. You get a headache with it, and you, get, you say, oh, I'm okay. But you're a little disoriented for an hour or so. This technique will knock somebody out cold. This technique can kill the person because you can hit with the knuckles and really dig into the pressure points. When you're coming back with these pressure points and coming out like this, the next technique you see is this. That always looked goofy to me. What would you do in a real fight, a real self-defense technique that would do this? This is real important. It maps out pressure points on the legs that you would attack pressure points that you would kick, that you would take out on the individual. If I kick this pressure point like I would do in the form and strike the person on pressure points, you'll knock them out and do it very seriously. Uh, come on, let me use you a minute. And when I do this, I'm going to do it real lightly. I don't want to hurt him. But if they're standing somewhat facing you, now let's see, would be a good angle for this. I'm going to do this way. Okay, if they're standing facing you, you can take that heel and catch the heel right on the inside of their leg here. Watch what happens. They buckle. Notice which way his head turned. If he's reaching in and grabbing at me here, and I bring my hand down in this position here and pop him on the side of the neck. It's very, very easy. Right on the edge of the neck here. Right here. Right at the articulation of the jaw. 
is a pressure point. If I use that little knuckle of mine and I just lightly tap, and you got to be careful when you do this because if they have their jaw open, you can dislocate the jaw. But just a little tap takes the person out very, very easily, very, very gently. Thank you. This kick on the inside of the leg, if they're standing in front of you, you can kick it this way. But by the same token, I could do like a front kick here and kick there and come across to the front side of the head and turn them and use, again, that knuckle and a strike and get a good buzzing technique. The last technique is here. If somebody grabs you, you can roll them and punch to a pressure point down on the side. If they're taller, if they're a little bit taller and pull them down, you can hit with a punch right on the side of the neck. And again, take them out. So you can go through the entire form, thanks. The entire form and have some kind of application or some meaning to the technique something in there that's going to give you a real self-defense technique. Each movement in a form, each movement in a form has a real honest-to-God meaning about something to do to hurt somebody. Even techniques that look like this, that you're blocking somebody, you're actually striking. We're talking about this technique here. That this is a block against a punch, or it might be a strike to the head and the neck. Which hand am I striking with the head or the neck? The extended hand. The extended hand. I'm going to offer you an alternative explanation. I'm going to be hitting the neck with this hand. How's your hands go? On the lightning block. Your hand comes back like this. Your hands come out here together in it. See, in some styles they do. They cross like that, though, don't they? Oh. So if your hands cross like here, could there be a technique right here? Let me show you. This is fun. If my hands are going like this, as I do the knife hand strike, I could be glancing off the front of his head and striking back here and getting that pullback like that <laughs> in this one <laughs> with the knife hand block you can use the side of your hand chop along the sternal clavicle muscle right on the barrel receptor and palm on the forehead so that you're getting this action out of the knife hand so if you're in here let him down there A good knockout by just this, this portion of the technique. By the same token, though, you can do the same type of technique if, um, for example, here, uh, Jim, let me use you. There's a pressure point right along between the brachial radialis, right on the edge of that. If I press in on that, you're going to get some pain if I use the tip of the thumb. If I strike it down and in at a 45 degree angle, the knees buckle, this hand goes back, the head comes forward, and the chin turns to the side. So, if I grab there and strike, here I get a nice reaction. By the same token, if he's punching on the arm like this and striking, I can strike the pressure point at the wrist with the back of my hand, and also with the arm at the same time. Let's try it over here. Punch. And get a knockout. One pressure point. Two pressure point, three pressure point. With the right angle and direction, you can cause a knockout on the arm. When you hit that pressure point on the arm, if you make your hand like this, thumb straight out, 
little finger out and curl a little bit, you can hit with the knife edge portion of your hand and the knee portion of your thumb. So if I'm grabbing the wrist and laying my hand across that point on the arm, I am dead on both pressure points. Now, if he punch, if he's throwing a punch in at me, I can hit on the arm and strike on the arm at the same time. And what does that look like? Same thing. So if that hand comes in, there, you can get a knockout on the arm. If you bring your hands back like this, like a lot of karate styles do before they do the knife hand block, if the person comes in with a punch or a grab, this hand can come to the side and grab and strike on the back side of the neck here on that pressure point. So the hand comes in. You okay? And very gently get that beginning knockout. But this explanation here of the hand coming in on the side of the neck, striking in here and striking in those pressure points for that section of the knife hand block makes a whole lot more sense to me than he's throwing a punch and I bring my hand back here to gain power and momentum and then I strike the arm. Wait a minute now. Punch slowly. And I'm going to come back here. Wait a minute now. When I, I see you punch, I've got to bring my hands back here to get power to block your punch. So you punch, and I bring my hands back here, and then I try and get my... No, you're slow. Bring it a little bit faster. And you're not going to make it. It's not going to work. Which makes more sense. You're getting close where a fight's going to occur, and you just come right across with that. That makes more sense to me. Yes, when you're hitting the top corner of his head and his neck, are you crossing sides? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Which is dangerous. Well, I, I mean, I'm, just, I'm not yeah. guessing. I just, just wondered that. It is dangerous, that, yes. That is crossing cross cross sides. Cross yeah. That, that's why the form goes like this. Because it is dangerous. And they want it to be. And they want it to be. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> I get in a real fight. You dang on right. I want it to be dangerous. You're, you're doing this? I'm doing this like the cut. This like the form does. But I'm only using a small portion of it. You see? I'm not using all of this back here. If I use this portion of the kata, then I can do this. If he's coming in with the hand and I bring my hand back, then I can get this kind of a knockout. There. Pressure points can be extremely dangerous. They can be very, very violent. But that gives you the whole secret to the movements in karate. That tells you the angle, the direction, and the way to go with the technique. If the movement does not look like the movement in the form, it is not, in my opinion, a good explanation for the self-defense technique. It has to follow along, form and function. They're one and the same. You want to be able to build conditioned reflexes. So the person attacks you in a certain way, you're able to respond with a certain kata or a movement out of a kata. People used to practice one or two katas their entire lifetime. They would not practice 15, 20, or 30 katas. They would do one or two, and that would be it all of their life. As Americans, we get bored if we only have one kata to do. It's because we don't study it. We don't go into enough depth. You need to work your forms going in-depth. Concentrate about what they are. Think about the self-defense applications you can get out of them and work with them. Have fun with the techniques. Four fingers up from the ankle bone, the pressure point, right here. Right at the edge of the bone is a good, good, good pressure point. If, give me your foot. Now don't hold, don't put your hands on. Just catch when it falls. If you use the palm of your hand 
and spike that pressure point here. You can take the person down real easy with that. Okay. That's a technique I've been working on, and I'm real close to getting a knockout with that. If you get that foot right in here, and use the palm right into here, don't hold on to it. I don't like that. Okay, if you do this movement, piano one, return, come down, and punch. A lot of people tell you that you're punching somebody in the solar plexus. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He's smaller than me, but he's a lot firmer than I am. A little bit punchy. If I try and hit him in the solar plexus with my fingertips, I lose. If, however, he's choking, choke me, and I grab his hand and press on a pressure point, What's that look like? Exactly like the form. So now he chokes. I press the pressure point, grab the fingers, rotate over, grab his arm, pull down. My hand now comes back to my waist, and I turn and do a down block. Then I step forward with that, and I punch. Remember that hard point back here? If I lightly tap that, that hurts, and your fingers go numb, which makes more sense. You're punching somebody in the solar plexus, or you're pushing, getting their attention, grabbing the fingers, locking them down, turning, and then setting forward the punch. Right behind the leg here is a pressure point. If you grab the pressure points right at the ankle, and again, use the cupping of the hand, strike it back and forward to a 45. They're turning around this little bit so you can watch his face. Coming in here and strike. 